Agostino Zynga show with I, your host Agostino Zynga, and this is episode number 776. That is 776 of the Agostino Zynga show with I, your host Agostino Zynga, and I hope you are doing well wherever this lovely podcast may find you. I hope you are doing swimmingly. How am I? All good, all things considered, I cannot complain. All good, all things considered, I cannot complain. For those of you who may be tuning in live to this lovely podcast that I'm now currently doing, <sighs> I've had some time to process the fucking result. Man United 4, or Man United 4, Crystal Palace 4, United fucking 0. And um, I'm still processing it in a way. Maybe I'm not really over it. It's still something that I'm still having to kind of wrangle my brain around because I still can't figure out how we let a pretty i wouldn't say they're ordinary but they didn't really have to do much to beat us that's a really concerning bit about the loss against crystal palace they didn't really have to do much to beat us they really didn't have to do much um and we essentially crumbled as soon as the first goal went in i didn't really see us having any way back in terms of rescuing the match it wasn't ever going to happen and it just felt like it was inevitable it was going to be a bit of a drudging now, some people are suggesting that this is always on the cards. We had this coming for a long, long time. We kind of put it off for a while. We were able to get some jammy results that we probably never deserved, even though some of our fans would like to tell you differently and like to celebrate wins, even when we play terribly, as if there's something to really celebrate and really get behind. But if you know, you know, if you're a fan of the club, you've been supporting the club for a long time, you know what our standards are. And you also know that, you know depending on the competition in the league we're currently not really there where we need to be so if we want to get back to where we need to be we need to be beating teams in this we need to be winning games in a certain style we can't just be banging out the results grinding them out and hoping to you know have a team ahead of us slip up not going to be happening they're all playing with style they're all playing with you know um you know they're all playing with a sense of control dominance and just pure attacking prowess that we're really struggling to match but forget all that attacking stuff just the defending the defending alone is really scary because we had we've had a few injuries at the back clearly that's not going to help but the way that we capitulated our lack to our lack of or the our inability to stay compact our inability to kind of you know cover up our deficiencies our inability to kind of see where the flow of the game the momentum was going and kind of shut certain things down like i think olise being the best example olise obviously was the star player for crystal palace he scored two and just was on fire the whole entire match it kind of felt a little bit like an audition like because you know we've been linked heavily with olise and i felt like he was aware of that and was trying to remind the brass at united to you know sanction a signature for him because you know he's obviously a really good player but i felt like the elise thing it was pretty obvious that he was on fire that he was obviously had his tail up we should have shut that down early someone should have came in the back of him took him out and really kind of put him off and sort of like you know disturbed his equilibrium to some extent instead we gave him all the space on the field he was pirouetting he was doing flick passes and stuff he was controlling balls with his instep like he was taking the piss to be completely honest and the fact that no one really put the boot in him kind of shows that a lot of those players kind of gave up i remember there was actually a section towards the second no, there was a section just before the first half where the players were on the side of the pitch about to come on and you know have if anyone's played sport anyone's played any sort of like organized sport you know that look in the people's you know that look in someone's eyes when they don't want to be there and I, when I checked my stream and I was watching it, I could see in the eyes of United players, they didn't really want to be there. They were super over it already. Um, they were, you know, basically defeated before the second half had even started. And I think by that point, we're only 2-0 down. So that goes to show that the players had essentially thrown the towel in. So obviously, that's very concerning. But to go back to the defensive thing, this has always been my issue with Eric Ten Hag. And I think this has been one of the saddest things about his tenure. I, like a lot of fans, was really eager to get Ericsson Hag at United, right? We saw what he did at Ajax. We saw that attacking brand of football. And a lot of us fans, myself included, never thought Ericsson Hag was going to come to United and win us the Premier League or win us the Champions League. No one with brains thought that. But what we did think, he was going to come in and he was going to build a squad full of technically proficient, you know, 
football players and get us playing in a certain way that would maybe lead the, let you know lay the groundwork for the next person to come in and then take us to the next level. That's what I think most people were thinking. Instead, he came in under the remit of having to win every single game, which then made him play all our best players every single game. But our best players aren't used to playing that level of intensity every single game. They're also shit cunts, the most of them. Luke Shaw and a few other people included. So they tend to get injured often. So the players that he relies upon to get the grind out of the results, to get us further up the table, to win cups and stuff or whatever else, they also get injured. So they end up letting him down. And then he ends up having to rely on players that he clearly doesn't fancy. And one of the things that I don't like about Ericsson Hogg is that he clearly doesn't like to rotate his players. He likes to stick with a core group of like 13 players or so. But we don't have the quality, even in the 13, to sustain that level of performance. They don't have it in them. So when you then have a player injured from that 13 and you have to rely on one of the subs who hasn't been given any love or hasn't been shown that they're an important part of the squad and they obviously haven't had the practice, don't have the form, it's a recipe for disaster. So this was always kind of on the books and always on the cards, but it is a bit more, it hurts a bit more when it's against a, I wouldn't say an average team, but you know, a mediocre team in the Premier League with a new manager who hasn't even been there six months. They've already got a style of play. Um, they already spotted our weaknesses. They took advantage of them and they won the game, you know, fair and square, to be honest. So I don't really have any complaints. The only complaints I have in terms of the game itself was obviously our individual player performances. I thought Andre Onana, um, you know, Andre Onana might be one of our worst, you know, number ones we've had in a very long time. I thought there was at least two goals from that flurry of four that he conceded that he could have saved. Even towards the end, there was a shot. I forgot who it was from. It might have been from Olise. Or it might have been from somebody else. Uh, maybe maybe Eze, I'm not too sure. But there was a shot towards the end that would have made it 5-0 that hit the post. And Onana was, was rooted to the ground as if it was some like really good shot. That was really annoying. All of it was just annoying. The whole thing was annoying. I hated the whole entire game. Um, I wanted it to end sooner rather than later. And if anything, it's a good thing that we ended the season like this. Because it all but guarantees that we won't play in Europe next season. And I feel like a lot of our fans are really delusional and a lot of them think just because we get into Europe, it kind of, you know, negates our issues. So I think when we don't get into Europe, it sort of wakes up the club, the fan base in general to see how far we've fallen. And when we struggle to get in Europe again next season, which I think we will, it will maybe wake up people to realise that we are so far away from where we need to be that, you know, just signing a player or just getting a marquee manager hiring isn't going to fix things. Like the issues with United are deep rooted and a lot of it has to do with the players that are currently at the club. A lot of those players need to be sold, need to be moved on immediately. Whether or not that will happen is another thing. But, you know, there's a long road ahead of us for United. I don't really see any real light in the tunnel. I'm not going to lie. Um, the only light in the tunnel that I thought was going to happen was if the Glazers sold the club in its entirety. They never did. They ended up fucking, you know, pulling a farce on us and saying they went to sell the club and then turning around and changing their mind so fuck them so yeah we're fucked essentially we are fucked for the longest time ever um nothing really is going to change and we have to hope and pray that you know a miracle happens where we get another Sarkis ferguson maybe the glazers helicopter crashes somewhere but if that doesn't happen we are well and truly fucked and no one's gonna save us so let's just you know enjoy the ride as we can and kind of go from there but united lost 4-0 to crystal palace um again not surprised don't really fucking care fuck the players fuck the club fuck everything about that fucking football team and you know the sooner the season ends the better to be honest the sooner the season ends the better to be honest but hey what do i know absolutely nothing you know absolutely nothing cool moving on from that one let's talk about this so i've just seen this on my stream or just seen this on my browse while i was checking internet and i discovered that channel trays um an artist that i'm a big fan of mostly makes like house music i'd say has got a new single out at the moment right channel trays has a new single out at the moment and it's funny because if you see the actual single album cover or the name of the track is called Berghain, which is fucking cool but the single album, the, uh, you know, the artwork for the actual track itself is even cooler because it features artwork that looks similar to the actual sign that Berghain have on the Instagram where it says not to take pictures and shit. So it's a similar type of font and style. 
um it's kind of like in a light box sort of effect it says channel trays the track is called burkine from the album head rush um and it's about to be coming out soon i'm assuming so i actually want to listen and react to the tune in real time so let's check out the actual tune itself this is channel trays the track is called burkine this is a new song and he's also got a video to boot as well so i want to see what i want because you know i'm a big fan of channel trays he usually makes housey he kind of makes everything to be fair he's a very you know he's what people would deem to be multi-genre but i'm curious to see what his new track is called um channel trays featuring somebody called barney bows oh sorry barney bones Shit. i was in berlin at Bergheim. Yeah, that's a fucking vibe, man. Big up Channel Trays. That's a fucking vibe. Big up Channel Trays. That's a fucking vibe. I really fucking enjoyed that. Big up Channel Trays. That was absolutely banging. So, um, judging by the music video, judging by the vibe, it's clear to see that. So, so judging by the <laughs> judging by the music video, and judging by the or judging by the visual, I, I like what they're calling it now, right? Music videos are no longer videos now. They're usually they regard they regarded as visuals or whatever that means. So judging by that, it's pretty obvious that Channel Trays was recently in Bergheim, and he had one of those you know life altering life altering experiences that we all have when we first entered that fucking special club, and now he's kind of synthesized that in a track, and it's an interesting track because he's been able to somehow you know um capture the essence of being in there and just more so the trippy sensory overload part of it of all these things going around you the bodies moving around you the intertwining the intermingling the sopping of salivas um the sweat 
the heart palpitations, the shimmering of the shoulders. Because that's what you see a lot sometimes. People just, with their t-shirts off, you just see like these shoulders like shimmering in the distance and stuff, right? Um, collarbones protruding all over the places, right? Buccal fat removals, shiny foreheads, painted nails, all of that good stuff. And he's somehow been able to synthesize it in a video where he's obviously not in Bergheim filming it. But he's obviously been able to do it in his own way. And I love the fact that he's done it in a way where he's almost like the viewer, spectator. Because I've done the same sort of thing when I've been in clubs. Especially when I go to like nights like Inferno at the Colour Factory. I'll sit down. I'll sit down and I'll have my drink or whatever. And I'll just kind of look at the masses and just kind of see them all swaying from side to side. That's something I kind of miss about going to berlin a lot was that the clubs over there have chairs and i know this sounds like a really boomer thing to say but it is quite nice sometimes when you're tripping or when you just want to have a different sort of vibe in a nightclub you can just sit down and watch people dance watch people move you know take in all the visual and you know sensory kind of stimuli and just kind of process it all without having to dance because that's the only annoying thing sometimes about clubs i think sometimes the club situation it forces you into the it forces you on the dance floor you have no other choice but to congregate in this small area in front of the dj booth whereas sometimes i feel like the best clubs are the ones where you're able to just be in your own little corner still listening to what's going on but being in your own little space you don't have to all gather right at the front of the fucking barriers next where the dj is and try and get their attention so i feel like he did a good job of kind of like you know depicting what that kind of berlin bergheim type of vibe is all about where it's just about you know being in a space where everyone's just free to be themselves and you're kind of also free to do what you want to do and you're just kind of processing it all in real time and then hoping that you can remember stuff to kind of you know take the tales back to your friends back home and kind of tell them and say hey there's this amazing place you need to check out so i think challenge Trace has done a good job of doing that um genre wise i'm not too sure where to kind of pin it it's all over the place to be fair which i love um i love the fact that it's a it's a you know it's a track called bergheim that could easily be played in panorama bar and vice versa um and also i'd imagine this is like his calling card his attempt to kind of get these guys attentions and i love it because i think he's a really good dj he's a really good artist a really good producer and i'd love to see him play at fucking bergen at one point i really did enjoy that track that track was fucking amazing um so big up um channel trays for that and if you're not familiar with channel trays um one of my favorite tracks from him actually is this track that he did with um tired the creator back in the day um called fuego actually which you might know of um it's really good it's, it's from his album that came out a while back as well um the track is called fuego featuring tired the creator and this is actually more of what you would expect to hear from channel trays but it's kind of been moving around changing his style um i'd say he's kind of doing a bit of a cachinada in terms of like you know he's coming with one sound but he's constantly evolving it and changing it and molding it and harness what well, and kind of perfecting it and just kind of experimenting go different places so it's quite nice to see him now even the look is completely different right he's got like dreads now he's got a full beard he's wearing a choker like he's constantly reinvented himself from where he was so this is um fuego version tyler the creator channel trays one of my favorite tracks from him let's go
Yeah. And yeah, you get the gist. That is Channel Trades featuring Tyler the Creator, one of my favorite producers, artists out there at the moment. Great to see him trying to push his way into the electronic dance music field um, or area or genre. Great to see, of course, being a black man as well. It's pretty important to have those voices and those people out there um, to be inspiring the new kids coming up and stuff and showing them that they also can take part and not just view the stuff from the outside in. So great to see. Hopefully he does play Berkheim very soon and hopefully it works out for him because he's one of my favorites and I'd love to see him trying new interesting things and kind of pushing the envelope as per usual. So big up channel trays, big up channel trays. Um, continuing on from that, continuing on from that. Oh, actually, did we get, um, oh no, there we go. I, I forgot to play this actually. Um, let me quickly read this as well. So this is Channel Trades, obviously still announcing the details of his debut album. So this is obviously tying into the, um, what you call it, track that we heard called Berghain. He actually announced some details here for his debut album, courtesy here of Pitchfork. So let me get this up for you again so we can read it quickly. Um, it says here, Channel Trays announces debut album, shares new single um, called Berghain. Listen, the Compton DJ and singer producer shares his full length debut album called Head Rush. Um, for years, Compton DJ, again, he's from Compton as well, which is fucking cool to see in it. Somebody from there making the music that he does. Um, so big up him. Um, for years, Compton DJ, singer and producer Channel Trace has been releasing singles and EPs. He's now ready to release his debut album. The new album is called Head Rush and it's out on June 5th, 14th on RCA Records. Um, Channel Trace has also been uh, releasing a new song called Berger in collaboration with Barney Bones that's billed as an album's lead single. Um, it's about the time I played at Berghain, how this culture in that environment made me feel. I didn't feel weird um, anymore, Channel Trace explained on his new song. Everyone's the same. The goal for everyone in that place is to enjoy themselves and be free. And music played a pivotal role in that. It was the main thing for me and I wanted to document that experience I had there through music so that I always have the memory in my life so I can feel the memory while I'm performing and relive the experience. Oh, that's fucking sweet. I love that. That's a really well put sentence there describing how that feeling is. Channel Trey's debuted in 2018 with God Mode single Controller, a track from the standouts called Jack Black and Glide featuring his debut self-titled and Channel Trey's released another EP called Black Modes in 2019 and dropped projects called Can't Go Outside Reef fresh and real cultural shit so yeah eager to see what the album sounds like when it does eventually come out should be interesting should be expansive should be new should be fresh can't wait can't wait big up channel trez big up channel trez we fucking love to see it we love to hear it what an absolute g moving on from that one we got this article here actually courtesy of the one and only bloomberg that regards the slow death of the urban nightlife this is an article that's been shared on my side of the internet for a while haven't had a chance to read through it so we're going to read through it together with you um the byline says soaring costs safety concerns and noise complaints are strangling after dark economies from london to montreal but campaigners aren't going down quietly so let's hear what bloomberg has to say about my fucking beautiful nightlife right the scene that i kind of have grown up in you know evolved in matured in have kind of made my way through life in is now suffering and it's on its knees because for the most part i think it's fairly safe to say nightlife has never really recovered since covid in it like it's one it's the one area i think around the world that has never really got back on its feet fully since covid and i'm not too sure if it ever will that's the wild bit about it nightlife has never fully recovered it just has never fully recovered and i don't know if it's because people have moved on appetites have changed um i don't know it's just there's something about it it's, it's never been the same since 2000 and what 1920 god almighty um it's just past midnight it says here on saturday in soho and the 24-hour shop is one of the few businesses still open the pub opposite is shut in his tapes taps as tapes taps nearby restaurants and staff are stacking chairs and the last train home to southeast london leaves in 15 minutes the eerie calm in one of London's traditional nighttime spots is hard to square with the recent post by Mayor Sadiq Khan promoting the city's round the clock credentials. Britain's capital is leading the world in 24 hour policy with our global cities looking at us for inspiration, he wrote on X last month. The social platform's community notes fact checked jumped in. Contrary to London Mayor's claim, London's nightlife is in decline. And London has responded with derision, accusing the mayor and his night czar, Amy Lammy, of hyping a scene which is reality faces a slow death and annihilation i remember seeing that tweet and it went viral obviously on my side of the internet 
it was just a gross mischaracterization of the situation it was just a pure and utter lie from our mayor to just paint the city as a 24-hour city when it clearly isn't um most bits of nightlife in the city close before 4 a.m anyway the ones that open past 4 a.m close at 6 there is no one 24-hour club folders kind of build as a 24-hour club but it's not really they have licenses they could obviously use throughout the year but they don't really you know they're not able to open 24 hours from friday to sunday not really so the 24 hour you know london thing is mostly to do with just transportation i'd imagine you know for the most part regardless of where you are in london you can get some form of public transport back home 24 hours a day most weekends so that might explain why they say 24 hours but when it comes to clubbing or doing anything outside after like 12 11 you are fucked so that was always a lie it continues a wave of closures in recent years add weight to the charge of the city after dark and decline between the onset of covid in march 2020 and december 2023 some 13,800 uk nightlife businesses including clubs bars and restaurants shut about 3,000 of which were in the Greater London region, according to Nighttime Industries Association. Prominent recent closures include Workhouse, Brixton's Club 414, and GAY late in Soho. GAY shutting in Soho was definitely a surprise. Um, it's one of the only, you know, pop, you know, it's one of the only places in Soho that's open super late. It's got a super big following of like gays in the area anyway. And just in general, girls that like to go there because they don't want to get bothered. Um, it's known for people, if you work in Soho or work there, you know to go there because they usually have really cheap drinks. I think if I remember correctly, they have the cheapest pint in Soho. I think they sell it for about three fifty or four pounds. So it was always the kind of undercover spot to go to if you worked retail or worked in the area to kind of go for drinks after work. So when GAY closed, that's when I knew London was really in trouble because that place is always busy and popular to me. So I was surprised it couldn't survive. Um, though walloped by COVID and the cost of living crisis, the scene um, the de deterioration long precedes the pandemic and echoes far beyond London. About three quarters of UK nightclubs have shut since 2005, and there won't be any left come 2023 or 2030, sorry, if the current trajectory continues, according to Sasha Lord, Manchester's first nighttime economy advisor and co founder of Warehouse Project. Even pubs are collapsing, or with the overall number of, of dropping by a quarter since 2000, according to the British Beer Pub Association. I wish we could swap Amy Lammy for Sasha Lord, or better yet, you know send emmy lammy packing in general and just get sasha lord to replace her because he seems to be a real good egg you know it obviously helps that he you know is a bit of a promoter club owner and just an all-round scene guy himself back in the day but he seems to be doing a really good job for advocating for nightlife awareness and just causes and shit and obviously going back to his home uh places i think it's manchester as well and advocating for those places like, he seems to be really plugged in and active unlike amy lammy who just clicks her check and keeps it moving so let's continue here Local music venues have been uh, probably suffered the worst. London has lost about 35% between 2007 and 2015, prompting um, a targeted rescue plan backed by then Mayor Boris Johnson. Interventions helped slow the decline. His successor Khan said about a year in the office, but the venues now face more than ever. Uh, now face threats of closure more than ever. Of 120 across the UK and 223 during the worst year of the closures in the last decade, according to the Music Venue Trust Chief Operating Officer Beverly Witterick, about 38% lost money and the entire sector will be bankrupt. Um, the night hasn't gone totally silent, to be sure. Well promoted festivals, events, and big ticket concerts featuring artists from Stormzy to Taylor Swift have been on a tear and will remain strong. The NTIA, NTIA says even ABBA holograms in London East End were minting more than 2 million a week. But again, this is more proof that yes, the market is kind of dead now. The bubbles may be truly burst, but really and truly, if you're still doing interesting things, if you're still, you know, putting on good shows, people are still going to come out and watch you, you know, as obviously has been proved. Um, you know by recent things that i've obviously read and kind of discussed on this fucking podcast itself it continues here nightlife um, advocates in several of the hubs across the uk say the scene has similarly shaky ground in berlin renowned for its club scene and comparatively lax rules venues are also struggling now starting to recover from their worst year ever in 2023 tourist numbers have subdued compared to the before the pandemic inflation um, has stung the industry and people are spending less according to Lutz, 
Lich Stringer, the co-creator of Amsterdam based nightlife industry consultancy Vibe Lab. And I think that's a sh that's the obviously what's happened. A lot of people just don't have the money, the means or the, you know, the wherewithal to fucking go traveling and to go do the whole techno clubbing thing that I do. Especially if you've got a family, especially if you're a grown up, especially if you don't really care about the scene like that. It can be hard to justify those things, especially nowadays. Everyone's kind of got used to enjoying themselves at home, you know, and that means figuratively and obviously literally people have enjoyed that more. So it makes it harder for people to be like, you know, hey, let's justify going away somewhere and spending all this money. We can just do the same thing at home and, you know, book yourself a nice and be here somewhere. And text and speakers and you're kind of done um two wars have also cast a long shadow after the russian invasion of ukraine um adding to germany's inflation um malaise growing social divides over the conflict in gaza have dampened the club scene in berlin probably more than any other city yeah those guys over there you have to give those guys credit um berliners are very politically active they're very socially active they get involved so they've been making some noise so I'd imagine even Hoare, that radio station, is probably struggling still to this day off of their kind of, you know, wishy-washy support of Palatine and shit. So I'm not surprised that this is causing issues in the local Berlin scene there. Um, to the, the Berlin probably more active than ever. Even with calling inflation and bright outlook, a quarter of the venues asks that they think about giving up in the next 12 months if it doesn't really get better. Um, more enduring... More enduring and existential threats, however, is skyrocketing in rents and property taxes or values. We are getting gentrified more and more out of the city centre and then we are gone, says Litschringer. You can see this in the cities like New York, London and Paris, which are not affordable anymore. That's also true for small cities like Nashville, Tennessee, which have taken over by corporations. Um, their country music makers lose, you know, their studios and rental contracts. It's pretty fucking wild how that shit is like a never ending story in a gentrification. Um, for those pushed by the periphery, common obstacles include limited transport services from one to five. Sydney is still shaky of the impact of so-called lockdown or lockout laws from 2015 to 2021, um, which is a current response to the alcohol related violence. Um, barred businesses and central businesses that are strict from accepting new patrons after 1 30 a.m that's something that we have here in london too we have a couple there's actually a shop near me that was open for a long time like until like six or even seven so even on weekends so what happened unfortunately because it's next to a pub people would kind of bleed over to the pub after they got chucked out of one and continue drinking outside of the shop obviously and this is like you know when you're drunk and you're high or whatever you don't feel the cold so this must be like you know easily I don't know, maybe a couple of drinks in and suddenly they're obviously yawning and not really enjoying themselves. Um, let's continue here. Prohibitive um, licensing rules have also been a nail in a coffin for most of the venues in London too, according to Lord, with many councils refusing to approve extended hours beyond 11 p.m. Imagine night a nightclub that doesn't stay open past 11 p.m. Can you imagine a nightclub you'd have to go to where it doesn't stay open past 11 p.m.? How boring that would be. Like, what the fuck, man? um let's continue here in camden a london borough famed for its live music bustling markets and counterculture a recent proposal to extend a framework hours from venues by case by case basis went back to the drawing board after objection you know from police and residents and whatnot it's like what of all the things that you want to kind of push or kind of you know make a thing is that it's like come on man have some you know have some class when it comes to those type of things but anyway we continue we digress um da, 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 da. the council has also received direct support um from the ladies um cat or something that might be sharing details and data that's fucking hilarious <laughs> apart from just the sending a tweet have you ever written the council's bill says have you ever taken part in council um about licensing and shit because ultimately that's how you change things is by getting involved okay cool 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 what can you do it seems like nightlife is struggling absolutely everywhere um there's no real kind of light at the end of the tunnel i'm not just sure when people are going to come back out again and rave it's not going to be anytime soon and um yeah we have to make the best of what we have available at this current moment that's the only thing we have to do make the best of what's currently available at this current moment it's hard as well like i find it a doubly difficult myself to go out and really justify spending you know a hundred pounds on my night out you know which doesn't probably include any drinks it's just me you know getting myself ready getting a cab all that shit is already a hundred so 
it's making it entirely difficult for regular people to jump out unless they are super balls deep interested in it like i am which most people aren't because you know they're regular normal people who grow up who grow out out of it and don't need you know stimuli of a club every single time they go out so big up those people big up the mature ones big up the mature ones <laughs> moving on from the mature ones i wanted to post about this right this is a random topic that i really want to just expound on because it's going to lead to something that i've also been thinking about doing so I see a lot more of these posts online and most of them obviously have to do with Bergheim um, where people will post these misconnection posts, right? And this is a really popular thing within the dance music scene, especially in the places like Bergheim and other places that are well-known clubs where you will maybe go to a club, you have a great time and you'll meet somebody there. And usually because you're in the throngs of ecstasy or whatever else you're taking or you're just giddy, you'll forget to exchange numbers or details. And then usually that person will then say, oh misconnection they'll be like on a forum saying oh yeah i was talking to this big seven foot swedish guy and you had blue eyes and did it, whatever right and they'll still post a soliloquy about this person online and half of the time it'll just be like a funny thing to kind of laugh at and kind of keep moving but now i'm starting to get to a point where i'm thinking you know some of the people out there legitimately can't just enjoy the moment they always have to try and like take the after party back home and i think again this is coming from someone like myself who's had a hard time i've had a real hard time struggled a lot with letting the situation just be what it is and not trying to pull it into the present or try and rekindle it or whatever i've kind of always been that guy and i'm even me i struggle to not do that sort of stuff right but i think it's entirely the best way to do that is to kind of just enjoy the moment for what they are because then what you end up happening in my experience anyway especially is that you end up having far more vivid memories of the time that you were there and what you did and whatnot instead of always looking for it instead of always looking at it through a lens and then not really appreciating you know um how great that random interaction was with that person because i can remember specifically one time i was in Berkheim and i happened to be in the toilets before somebody then they knocked on the door and basically was trying to check if their friend was in there i opened it. it i wasn't their friend but they were happy to kind of chill and said hey do you mind if we share the toilet and we did and we ended up you know standing in this toilet yapping at each other for like an hour straight like and it was so fun you know we ended up bumping into each other a few times on the dance floor and that was basically it no instagram was exchanged no phone numbers and stuff absolutely zero and that was perfect and i think it's something that you kind of have to learn but i also don't think it's something that you know <laughs> i also don't think it's something that a lot of people like to do because you know maybe real life is actually kind of boring so you kind of want to replicate that thing you know obviously in your private life but I think this also kind of leads to something that I've been thinking of doing. And I'm thinking that I kind of want to write a book and I want to make it like, you know, half fiction, half nonfiction and kind of frame it in the framework of like a, you know, of a memoir in sorts, obviously change some details and names and stuff. But the idea behind it would be to kind of de depict or sort of like, you know, um, describe my nights out and the stories and the people that I've seen, all these kind of things that I've kind of never really shared and stuff and just kind of put that in a book and, you know, essentially pose the question to the reader, like, did this happen or did this not happen? Or is this a story that I heard from somebody else that I'm kind of, you know, putting from my own lens, like loads of different things like that I'm thinking of kind of doing going forward as well, especially now that I've got, you know, so a new setup and shit. I think I'm going to try to exploit it as much as possible and try and see, or not try it i'm going to read write a book and obviously use that as a way to kind of you know tell the story of being somebody that could describe themselves as a fucking what um as a techno tourist or something or whatever it is man and trying to find the next big thrill comparing notes of different clubs and scenes and people around there who plays the programming all those things will be super important and cool to kind of check out so that will be arriving soon you know as soon as i visit all those places i want to check out but um and again um i'll remember this partly because of this obviously these bird kind of misconnection posts people keep posting and i also remembered it weirdly enough because there was a video i'm not going to show you which one but there was a particular video that i saw online um i think it was from a vice video or something and weirdly enough one of the posts i used to i used to read like i used to write like field reports on i forgot what forum it was i think it was like a mark i think it might have been like a marketplace forum on the darknet back in the day i'd write these like field reports right and they were very detailed and very what very wanky you know they, i took myself way too seriously and shit and somebody featured one of those posts on a video like a youtube documentary type thing in the background and i recognized it straight away i was like oh shit that's something i wrote on the forum back in the day 
I was like, oh shit, I should actually get back on the writing tip and start, you know, putting out more of that stuff because I think a lot of people, you know, would be pleasantly surprised to learn about some of the hijinks and madnesses that I get up to when I'm outside sometimes. And, you know, and it's also going to be like one of those things of kind of bearing your soul and being honest about, hey, you know, I don't want to do the whole like, hey, um, you know, I don't want to just do the whole thing where you're like trying to chase connections, trying to relive things trying to copy and paste things into your real life which usually doesn't really work out too well so that should be happening soon as well when it comes to all that good stuff so a book is coming soon i tell people out there who have missed connections in clubs leave it alone enjoy the moment for what it is whether you're sharing a drink sharing war stories or sharing saliva enjoy it in the moment be present if you happen to you know exchange details or call but if you don't it's all cool too because i don't think anything beats a little bit of um serendipity I remember once, especially this is concerning when I went to, this might be when I went to LA or that I go to Berlin. I don't know. I think it was actually LA. So when I went to LA one time, I stayed in this really cool hostel. I met some cool people. I did a whole kind of club run tour and stuff, whatever it may be. And then I also had like, you know, people that I met in there saw themselves that are really cool. This one particular guy that I met in there was this Australian dude with like a ponytail, right? I'm sure most of you guys know who I'm talking about. You know, we've seen that caricature in every fucking hostel that ever existed. Uh, you know, Australian dude with a ponytail. Is he 45? Is he 32? Who knows? But I, you know, had a good time with him and, we never really exchanged details. We just always were hanging around each other when I was in the hostel. And then randomly one day when I went to Berlin by myself, I was walking down the street about to go to a shop to buy some beers or whatever. I hear someone screaming my name across the street. And guess who it is? You know, however many years later, that guy. He happened to be in Berlin for that weekend to visit, you know, a long distance girlfriend, which of course makes sense for him. And I was like, wow, look at how amazing that was of an interaction. Because I'm sure if I was, you know, following on social, just being around, I would have definitely you know been robbed of that kind of shock of seeing somebody that you kind of bumped into randomly at some party somewhere you know in another country another continent now suddenly you're seeing them on the streets of berlin i think is really important so i wish most of people would just let go of the misconnection thing you know it didn't happen for a reason and just kind of keep it gucci but hey you know what can you do some people are different some people are hella hella different but yeah i'm really looking forward to that book i think it's going to be a great chance for me to kind of you know um what you call it dust off the old skill set when it comes to my writing and just generally you know try my best to sort of like synthesize and you know put down onto paper all those things and experiences and stuff and see them over the years and try maybe i don't know maybe it's a cautionary tale maybe it's just an attempt to you know make myself look smarter i'm not really too sure but i'm eager to get started and get that going so you'll hear about that um as obviously it progresses and then we'll kind of go from that and kind of figure out what we're gonna do with it going forward but it's gonna be fun it's gonna be fucking fun to sort of relive all that shit and talk about it again it's gonna be fucking fucking fun i really can't wait i'm not gonna lie i really can't wait there's this other um, clip i want to play for you here this is courtesy of academics actually and i think a lot of people have the wrong impression of this particular clip and i want to play it for you so i could see if you think the same thing as i thought right so as you guys know um kendrick lamar or drake and kendrick lamar are beefing at the moment they're going back and forth record for record dub for dub at the moment people are suggesting that maybe you know um kendrick lamar has won for now even though the white flag hasn't been waved um if that's the case cool i still think it's that you know there it's a draw and if not i'd give it to drake slightly but i'm eager to see what does happen if the aidas you know bag comes in and it kind of looks a bit more worn and it should do anyway long story short drake and kendrick Lamar beefing and one of the people that's been reporting on it the best has been dj academics he's been doing live play-by-plays he's been live on stream when drake's dropped he's done like reactions like he's really kind of been on the ball and i guess because of that now out of the woodwork um charlemagne the god popped up and now wants to be his friend and obviously he's on the show and he's kind of giving him some time but I think the reality of the situation, from what I can understand anyway, especially when it comes to Charlemagne giving him advice because he's hired to go on the phone with him live on stream, I think the merit of what he's basically saying was that if academics really wants to be like, you know, an OG media figure and stuff or media personality, he needs to sort of like chill out with the insulting of people and artists and all that malarkey. You just need to be a little bit more... I wouldn't even say media trained, but it's just a little bit of consideration for people. That's probably the best thing. But anyway, talking about consideration, this clip features Joe Budden and academics talking. And it's funny because I think Danny from the top or Danny from the stop kind of in interpreted it as like, you know, Joe basically sunning, you know, him and telling him to do something he doesn't want to do. And I don't think it's definitely generally the case i think what ended up happening with this conversation with academics and charlemagne was that charlemagne basically wanted to remind academics that hey 
you've now got the attention of the world on you people are seeing what you're doing they like what you're doing your report is just getting a lot of press year now it's a confirmation you'd imagine for him to be like hey let's maybe you know refocus our attention onto other things outside of the messy gossipy type of stuff which you know he clearly probably loves too but I think that's what we want to see going forward from him himself. So let's continue and hear what he has to say or see what Charmaine said to academics regarding the whole situation. Which we is so many references, but you you were mentioned in back to back, and I think up until that point, Drake and Meek was probably you know I've always said just even me being ancillary on the internet covering that, it was like one of the biggest moments in hip hop. Um. You being there for that and being here for this, how do you think both compare? Like, like I feel like this is like surreal right now. <laughs> well, I think you know there is there's one definitive winner in all of this right now, and I think it's you. You know, and 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 and, and, I, and I hope you're really paying attention to the moment. You know, like like I told you earlier, like this is your moment to kind of like mm -hmm. you know rebrand yourself in a sense, you know, because like you, you, you got the reputation for being the shock jock who will say anything, you know, and, and people will say academics isn't good for hip hop. He's not good for the culture. They just say academic doesn't do anything, but you know, go on, go in on women. By the way, me and you've had these conversations for years. Like I, you know, I, I told you years ago to fall back from, from, from doing that, especially, you know, the, the, the going in on women piece. But I think this is a really good moment for you right now because the things that I always pay attention to you about and have always paid attention to you about is you being like the hip hop cultural critic. And I think right now, man, if you just keep doing that, keep it about music and just objective criticism of, of what's going on in regards to Kendrick and regards to Drake, I think, I think it's going to really shift how people uh, perceive you. And that's the truth. That's something that I've always kind of secretly hated about, you know, academics, even though I love his streams, I've always felt that he was partly responsible for the dumbing down of, you know, conversations and criticisms and whatever debates when it comes to music, especially hip hop. Um, when he introduced this obsession with first week sales, because first week sales was always a thing, but I think academics was definitely the person that took first week sales to the next level. Now it's become a barometer as to whether not an artist is worth keeping signed or if he's not keeping signed or if he's removed the stuff. I mean, it doesn't really make any sense, um, you know, why that became a thing but it was a thing so with academics i've always felt like if you would have focused more on the music and been somebody that was very vocal about criticizing single choices criticizing the structure of a song maybe the length of the album itself being very picky about somebody's live performances music videos all that sort of stuff i think that would have definitely gone a long way to essentially get kids to give a shit about music like that and to kind of go and listen to it themselves in their spare time, which I think a lot of people probably don't do because, you know, why else would the mum be doing those type of things? But I think it's very, 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 very important for people to kind of understand these sort of things that are going on behind the scenes. But I think for academics as well, on this particular phone call, you can see that, you know, Charlemagne just gave him, trying to give him a nudge and steer in the right direction so, he, so that he doesn't fumble this opportunity and then go back to revert, reverting course. To be fair to him, when it comes to the women accusation of seven women, I think a lot of those cases, or maybe one, it was just somebody that was being a bit obnoxious and stuff, so it wasn't like he did it to some random girl. Um, obviously, the other person in the middle is definitely his wife and the other lady on the, you know, and I think it's a whole catsuit as well that they're basically jumping on. But I would, I would like to see, um, you know, academics pivot away from the salacious, scandal type of things and just bring it back to just pure ball and stuff because that would be cool to see it kind of work out in a long time. But again, what do I know? What do I know? Absolutely nothing. We continue there. So we've done that. We've done that about academics being a fucking bad boy. And absolutely recovering his reputation so big up him for that one great to see um and then we also have this courtesy of the one and only um what's this called the analysis right this features um janis atikumpo right uh and tetu kupo as you guys know him the basketballer talking about hate on the internet with stephen a smith and i think he made a really good point about you know criticism and haters and you know critiques online i think you made a really good a point about who should be watching him and who shouldn't so let's hear what Janice has to say um i used to follow uh your show a lot but i i, I felt like that was kind of holding me back I, I wasn't able to to do what i was the goals what i was i set myself to do right. you know so i just want to say that 
man, like, it's hard what you do. 100%. Because I know you're a fan of the game. So, like, when you go and you have to speak the truth. You have to speak what you feel. Yeah. You know, about players, about coaches, about organization, about cities. You know, so so it's hard. But you still do that, mm -hmm. right? And, and I think a lot of people um, might not like you. Right. <laughs> you know, no, no. Uh, uh, but 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 at the end of the day, to be right. in the top of your game, which I, I believe you are, because before I came to the NBA, I knew who you you mm -hmm. were. Um, I I got I got to how you say I got to give you your flowers because it's hard to, you know, speak you know your give your take about LeBron James about um, me about Jokic about the team and then still be able to walk out of the studio with your head, head high and don't really like give to sort of my language right. to shit you, you 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 know so 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 I don't want you to think that uh, I don't understand it's hard um, thank you so much for being here with us thank you for so much for doing this for Thanasis um, thank you thank you um, yeah I but, well you know I got something for you because I, you want to say something to so go I, yeah. I want I want to say this because I think it's important that you hear this and that the audience hears this it's like <clears throat> yes there's a lot of players who don't like me yes it is absolutely true I can give less than a damn Good. it's absolutely true but there's a reason for that and there's several reasons for that number one for example, when you talk about you don't watch first take and stuff like that now, that's actually good. Mm -hmm. yeah. And the reason why it's good is because you out there performing, you got priorities. Mm -hmm. And anything that's gonna distract you to compromise your greatness, you shouldn't allow to get in their way. Matter of fact, people like myself and others can learn from that. I Which is actually true. And I think that's actually the right way to approach it in general. Most people who are actually doing the thing shouldn't be watching people talking about the thing really you don't want it to kind of you know just i will say cloud your decision making but affect it in some ways you know unnecessary fucking information all these things are just not necessary so i think you know all this com all the commentary stuff the stuff that i do should be left for the fans it shouldn't be for the practitioners of the thing they should never be paying attention to it especially the athletes in america that get really ripped into by a lot of these kind of talking heads and pundits and stuff in the uk or in europe it's a lot more mild well i think in the uk specifically i think other countries are probably a bit more rough but here you don't really get you know you don't really get pulled up and grilled anymore because if you did do that and you were a big network they might actually get your access to the met gala revoked so everyone's kind of wanting to be very cute and just you know cover their bases but i love what john basically said like hey i respect you as a critic i think you're awesome but also i don't need to be watching you because i'm doing the thing this is mostly for our fans and we can kind of keep it that way but i don't need to be all up in this fucking checking this out because it's not really for me because i'm out here on the field actually doing it so big up janice i really did love how you put that so big up fucking janice i really do like how he absolutely nailed that one big up him big up him moving on we have to talk a little bit about this as well this is courtesy of the one and only these links so this features this article that says I hate clubbing in Brooklyn and I wanted to check it out because, you know, um, these links has incredible um, the hate me section that I also wanted to kind of, you know, give a bit of love because it's one of my favorite newsletters on Substack for a while. Unfortunately, I think it's come to a close. so It's not really updating anymore, but it's been a fun ride. It's been a fun ride. So big up hate read, big up these links. This title is this is called So Community Will Rescue You will not rescue you sorry the title is this so-called community will not rescue you from a k-hole i hate clubbing in brooklyn raving in general and electronic dance music of all kinds so let's see if anybody else resonates with this so this starts off with a few weekends ago i stumbled into a nightclub in brooklyn where i spent a fair amount of my 20s it's one of those places that's not ex technically a warehouse but it's designed to look like one even though it's in a very nice expensive neighborhood and where immediately upon entry your senses are overloaded with fog strobe lights techno bleep beep and bops or beep and boops and the sweat and body odor of gay men for some of whom the musk is actually a turn on to be honest i had a couple of glasses of wine and also a martini and a shot of tequila but my immediate response was one of deep despair i started crying bawling actually squealing to my poor friends in tow something that has become increasingly clear to me lately i hate this i hate this i hate this 
And by this, I meant clubbing in Brooklyn, raving in general, and electronic dance music of all kinds. So pretty much everything that defines what nightlife means in this city nowadays. That's a brilliant sentence, isn't it? <laughs> and by, <laughs> uh, that's the thing. I realise this as I've gotten older. Like I've got less and less people to go out with in terms of my rave buddies. People just don't care anymore. And the ones that do kind of care don't really like it, you know? They just go for the social aspect of it, but they hate everything about it. The drama, the confusion, the unnecessary hassle, the searching, the fucking handy, you know, and touchy, close to you people, you know, trying to get your attention. All this sort of stuff is just annoying. So I understand why people do hate clubbing, but all the things that this person mentioned, I actually love. It continues. Nowadays, have you been there? It's another faux warehouse in Ridgewood, which despite the fact that it's um, predominantly den of sin, has a has the gall to pretend it is the some kind of glorious community centre promoting artistry, diversity, and where at the door they force you to listen to what they call their safer safe spiel, which among some other understandable things, warns you against staring at people. <laughs> okay this is too much imagine a nightclub giving you a fucking rule book to read or reading you the rule book as if you're like on some low budget airline and you're doing the fucking safety protocols they need to relax um they also got um a spill which among others is understandable things and warns you against staring at people non-consensually on the dance floor imagine you get banned for staring at people aren't where are you meant to look then inside yourself you meant to take out your eyebrows. You mean, sorry, you meant to take out your eyes. So, like, what's going on there? Um, if this happens to you, you can just alert one of the safe sound or safe space monitors in the glowing wristbands who might be able to get called to the dance floor police. But the crowd is too busy, is too ACAB friendly um, to think about doing that thing. So, let's continue. It says, don't get me wrong. I've had my fun in my wannabe raver. I've stayed on the dance floor for hours and hours and hours until the sun came up and bar closes. And nowadays seem to, you know, start serving up the bagels in the evening or start serving the bagels and oranges to all the structures, uh, strung up party goers, and then gone home and woken up every evening and straight back to the club on Sunday. I've traveled to other states to rave. I have even fell in love at the club with a once prominent, um, to, sorry, with one such proponent of his lifestyle, but now I'm a fucking tired. But now, or and now, I'm fucking tired. I'm tired of putting on a sensible shoe so I can last longer than my friends. I'm tired of forsaking cute outfits for what might not work well with the workout gear when I go out. <laughs> That's hilarious. I'm tired of dancing to music that, to me at least, all sounds the same and which I can't even enjoy unless I'm on the copious amounts of drugs. I'm tired of paying $80 or sorry, $50 or more just to get into one of these things, not to mention another $100 or on said drugs and then also $15 as a pop on liquored up yerba mates <laughs> liquored up yerba mates is hilarious and 30 dollars on an uber home to some godforsaken neighborhood and nine dollars on the bacon egg um cheese and perere that god willing will bring me back to life i'm jacking that sleeping regimen and let's be clear as well that you know that whole thing he broke down probably isn't you know 400 it's probably way more than that so big up him for having a good sense of humor um it continues here last bit uh, speaking of DJs, I'd like to take a quick moment to talk about another Scrooge of the um, it's elite young Brooklyn lights and inspirational multi hyphenate. Just because your Instagram bio says you're a DJ, an editor, a documentarian, a sculpture, a furniture designer, and a model, does not mean you are any of those things. In fact, if you describe yourself that way, you know, within a few hours, people kind of recognize and realize what's going on as well. So it's kind of like a two edged, double edged sword in that respect. Um, and then oh there's actually one oh there's more there's more it says here anyways being forced to participate in rave culture makes me want to move to a dumb, dumb fuck state where there is nothing going on during the weekends except maybe hitting up the wale house or waffle house sorry and then kind of going from there so i definitely understand all those sections there it continues here at least if i'm partying with them we all talk to each other every uh, even now know what else they can frown upon in nowadays dance floor talking know what else they frown upon on the nowadays dance floor they frown against talking dance dancing in there is usually uh, means people getting crazy and really kind of going for it 
and for some reason, I guess, you know, Elsa doesn't like that kind of thing. It continues to make it worse. My friends make me feel crazy for not liking any of this. I've taken to um, pathologizing myself, but I live in Brooklyn. I can say I'm a, I'm a quiet person, blah, 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 blah. But at the end of the matter or at the end of the day, if you don't enjoy something, especially when it comes to rave, just quit it. Quit it while you're ahead. You don't need to have somebody else um you know tell you when to kind of leave it behind or let the part or my f worst nightmare have the party tell you when you should go home so i definitely understand this um and it continues here none of this means i don't want to rave anymore i just want to diversify my nights and call this kind of nightlife for what it is a good way to spend some weekends nothing less nothing more exactly agree with that one this circle community will not rescue you from a k-hole that dj in the gas station sunglasses who thinks they look like balenciaga will not save your life tonight <laughs> that's a such a specific insult um what's the song by the smiths i'll leave you the lyrics music that's constantly played it's nothing to be about the life hang the dj hang the blessed dj cool big up um the person who wrote this anonymous again we don't know who fucking wrote this but i fucking enjoyed it really fucking good little article there talking about why they hate you know brooklyn nightlife which probably kind of applied to all nightlife scenes especially in london i'm sure there's a lot of similarities between what people do when they club in brooklyn via what they do when they club in london so big up the writer big up everybody involved i really did enjoy reading that little soliloquy anyways my friends that is it for right now that has been the excellent english show episode number 776 a little short one today just for the just for the vibes just for the bands you know how it is um if you're watching this show via the live stream please make sure you like the stream down below that'd be greatly appreciated if you're watching or listening to this show actually via the audio form of the podcast you will hear my tune of the day and my tune of the day today for you lovely people is going to be the one and only saint vincent saint vincent have a new album out at the moment and i think one of these tracks has definitely been one of my favorites so far so I want to play that for you as my tune of the day to kind of end the proceedings. So thank you again for those of you who have been tuning in and hanging out. It's always been a fucking, you know, pleasure to have your company. We're going to have a little bit of a, um, we're going to see this podcast out with a bit of St. Vincent. For those of you who love St. Vincent, and you will like this tune. If you don't, hopefully I'll put you onto something that you might want to listen to later. So this is St. Vincent from their brand new album called Big Time Nothing from their bad brand new album called is it brand new album no it's not big time nothing is it what's it called it's called all born screaming sorry all born screaming um so let's actually get this album up on here bear with me a second as i get it up on here it's called all born screaming that's a new album and the track that i want to play is my track of the day is gonna be the track called violent times let's go for violent times yeah so big up saint vincent appreciate them love them one of the, my favorite you know bands out there so i'm gonna play that one of my favorite tracks from them called violent times big up everybody listening appreciate all of you <laughs> 